This is the village of Eastry in Kent. And over the years, the villagers here have been tantalised by Anglo-Saxon finds. A warrior grave came up at the back of this house. Behind there, another burial laden with finds. But the most intriguing discovery was made just down the road. This beautiful gilded brooch dates to around 600 AD. Like some of the other finds nearby, it must have belonged to someone with a bit of cash to chuck about. So why did it end up here? Is this mysterious hill a clue to Eastry's Anglo-Saxon past? Could there even have been a palace here? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. In the 7th and 8th centuries, the village of Eastry was one of Anglo-Saxon Kent's most important settlements. According to documents, it was a focus of authority, a major administrative centre. And with high-status finds unearthed at Highborough Hill, just a mile from Eastry village, it seems the site could have been at the heart of this Saxon power base. Graham Caspell's family have farmed the site for almost a century. When did you realise it was something special? Well, I suppose really, well, from a very young age, you know, standing up here and playing, you know, you could just see for so far and just think, well, this must have some sort of historical interest. Have there been many finds up here? There have been finds all around the hill uh, from various different timescales. So, yeah, yeah, there have been. Mick? Hi there. Why are we here? Because this hill is very interesting, apart from the finds that you've been talking about, there are features on it and even on the look early that. maps, look. Look at that. Amazing. Ancient remains. It's like something out of Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and then the air pictures you see, like this one, have got soil marks or crop marks. I mean, you can make all sorts of things out of this. We've thought of it as a big enclosure or several enclosures. So, you know, something's going on here and we've got to find out what it is. I've seen the gilded brooch. Where did that come up? That one came up from this corner here. But in this corner here, right opposite, came what's known as a plated disc brooch, which is a kind of sandwich of gold and silver, a really amazing find. Um, and so things are spread right across this whole field, so we've got to have a really good look at it. Look, it's a very hilly hill in a very it flat is. landscape. Yeah. Could it be man-made? Oh, I don't think it's man-made, but I think it's been used a lot. You can pick prehistoric flints up round the edge just by walking across it. It's the sort of hill that nobody's going to ignore in the past for one reason or another. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do some geophysics across the middle of this, see if we can pick up these ditches. But I think even if we don't pick anything up, we'd still put a trench across to see what these features are on the air pictures. Trench one will confirm if the series of features is actually an enclosure that surrounds some high-status buildings. To pick up these features, it will be one of the longest we've ever dug on Time Team, running over 60 metres from the bottom to the very top of the hill. Trench two, on the south of the hill, will investigate these interesting geophys results. Because so many high-status finds like this 6th-century Saxon brooch have been found here in the past, we've also roped in an unprecedented number of metal detectorists to comb not just the spoil heaps, but the whole three acres of Highborough Hill. Andrew! And after just hours, the strategy's paying off. I don't know if you can see the look of satisfaction on these people's faces. Uh, some might even say a trifle smug. Uh, we never find anything decent halfway through day one. But, Jamie, what happened? Oh, we've just been uh, doing a metal detecting survey of yeah. the area and this was the first good signal I'd had all morning. Isn't it beautiful? 
What is it, Helen? Well, it's an Anglo-Saxon brooch dating to the 6th century AD. We think it's made of silver, but we'll have to get it cleaned up by a bridge. And look, it's got a garnet on it. You can tell it's a garnet because of the way it flashes and glitters as you move it in the light. It's amazing, isn't it? Well, you've demonstrated what you can do in two and a half hours. By the end of day three, I want the rest of this brooch, OK? <laughs> <laughs> but why would such high-status finds be here on this hill? What would their wealthy owners be doing in this area? In Saxon times, the name Eastry referred to a district, the eastern region of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Kent. This region needed an administrative centre and a place of assembly. According to 8th century documents, somewhere in Eastry there was a villa regalis, a Latin term that refers to a king's high hall. This major residence would have been a centre for the community, a wealthy power base, and a regular home to the King of Kent. So if there is such a major residence on Highborough Hill, it could explain the glittering high-status finds. All right, Bridge. I uh, believe you've got something for me. Ah, uh -huh, yes. Can I, can and in trench me? number two, Bridge has found what may be a key piece of supporting evidence. Look at this, two bits apart, Rebecca's got out of this oh, feature. Oh, that's a bit more like it. What do you think? Um, looks, looks Saxon to me. Are you sure? I think so, yeah. Um, this is the rim shirt from a jar. That's very typical of the early Middle Saxon pottery you get in Dover. Um, 450 to 850. OK. Um, what sort of size vessel is that going to be? It's hard to tell. It, they're handmade, they're not thrown on a wheel. If you look at right. it from above, you can see it's quite uneven. But it's probably something with a rim diameter of about that and sort of that sort of shape, size of body. Sort of nice, quite big there. <laughs> yeah, nice globular <laughs> cooking pot, very typical of um, the Saxon period. And the topography, uh, the position of this pit is quite interesting because we're on a south-facing slope. Right. You quite often get early Middle Saxon settlements on south-facing slopes. You're in the sunshine, but you're out of the wind. If you're on the top, you're in the wind. So it's, it makes it it's a nicer place to live, I suppose. It, it makes it a little bit more comfortable. And so we could have a little Saxon settlement just on this slope. If Paul's right and there was a settlement here, this could be the site of Eastry's Saxon centre of power. But no structures have yet turned up in the long trench where we thought there might be a substantial enclosure. Another less thrilling idea is that Paul's settlement was just a few low-status huts on the side of a hill. Hopefully these trenches will give us an answer. But there's also another contender just down the road in Eastry Village. Eastry Court is a Grade 1 listed mansion in the centre of the village. Based on documentary evidence, its owner, David Freud, believes that it's his house, not Highborough Hill, that holds the key to understanding Anglo-Saxon Eastry. Posh house, isn't it? Yeah, it's very nice, isn't it? Oh. Hello, David. Can we have a look inside your wonderful house? Well, come Thank on you. in. It's a bit good, isn't it? Have you got any idea how old it is? Well, we've got some clues, and uh, show that here when we... Go, go behind this oh. George and Panley. And here we've got uh, a wall uh, with some doors in it, and the wall dates from, the, from 1294. Uh, we know the date because we found the bills, and it actually cost the hall of, of which this is part, cost all of £11 and five shillings and something. <laughs> so this is the end of the hall where it's going into the kitchens and the pantries and stuff like that? That's right. God. Do we know if there was anything here before that date? Well, we do know that in that year they pulled down the hall that was sitting there before, so we know that it was continuously occupied right. for, a, for a reasonable period before that. And prior to that hall? Well, the rumour is that before that it was an Anglo-Saxon palace. Mm. Mick, I think <laughs> ten years ago I would have got so excited <laughs> yeah. at the prospect of an Anglo-Saxon palace, but the number of times we've hunted Absolutely. for Anglo-Saxon palaces, yes. what do we find? Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to be on to that this time? Well, it's possible. We've got some early timber work anyway. We're right next to the church. It's the right sort of site. It's a nice big flat site. So I would be more hopeful here than some of the others we've looked at. Wherever the palace exactly is, Eastry would have been the ideal place to build one. A major Roman road runs through the village, while the coast and port of Sandwich are less than four miles away and the building would have been pretty impressive. Our very own designer and trained architect, Ray San, 
is trying to reconstruct one. I've started making a basic model here of a sort of Saxon hall, and really now I could do with help. Well, it looks absolutely lovely, um, but one of the things that does immediately spring to mind is you're going to need a door in, e in the middle of each long wall, and it's going to have to be a door that's higher than the wall because you've got to be able to get through it without banging your head. It's quite a prestigious kind of entrance. And the second thing is that I don't think the roof is high enough because um, we need to be able to put, accommodate something like a, a cauldron chain above a fireplace. How long was that, Sam? Estimated 18 feet, the length of the chain. Right, and then you've mm. got to have the cauldron and the fire underneath mm. it, so a really high building. We're talking about a high hall, visible from many miles around, des designed to be seen, designed to be impressive, shining out across many lands. It's, it's wonderful stuff. Finding such a building is a real challenge, with very few examples in the country, let alone in Kent. The real problem is that this part of the world, we have never found anything like this. All we've got are these wonderful Anglo-Saxon cemeteries, hundreds of them around here, one of the biggest concentrations, richest concentrations, full of gold and all the rest of it. And what do we have in terms of the settlements? Virtually nothing. And mostly where they have been found in Canterbury and elsewhere, they are small sunken huts. So if we can even find big rectangular buildings as post holes, you've really hit the jackpot. But where is this palace? Is it down in the village at David's house? Or could it be up on Graham's Hill with the settlement we seem to have found? It's got to be out there somewhere. <laughs> the search means splitting our resources. In Bridges Trench, yet another find only adds to our confusion. Over oh. here, this iron vessel, that's what it looks like. Yeah. But it is sitting in the same material that the Saxon feature over there is cut into. I mean, this is the problem. Just because it's near something, it doesn't mean it's the same day. I mean, I take your point about it being in the same horizon, but, I mean, if it is a whole iron vessel and it is Saxon, then that's very unusual for a settlement site. It's something you'd expect to see in a cemetery. No, I'm not saying it definitely isn't. It may well be, but it's unusual. Yeah. Uh, all you can do is block it, lift it, x-ray it, I suppose, really. It's can the only you? thing we can do in the state that it's in, yeah. So perhaps the hill is a burial site, not a settlement. A kind of barrow, a hill-based cemetery. This would explain the high-status brooches buried with their owners. Helen, intrigued by the idea of graves, opens a trench in an area of the east side of the hill where metal artefacts have been found. But on the other side of the hill, the metal detectorists are adding to their collection. Tony, look at this, the most brilliant <sighs> golden object. Where'd you find it? Just down there. <clears throat> Just from metal detectoring? Yep. David, you... Could that be Saxon? It could be, but I'd want Helen to see it. It's just possible that it might be more recent. Tantalising. It's lovely, isn't it? Beautiful. Stunning. Look at that. Isn't that good? Well, we hope it's good. <laughs> Graham! <laughs> Worth coming over for, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, my I've God. Pack up Look at that. Last hour. I'm so isn't tired. that gorgeous? <laughs> it may be Saxon. Maybe, right. But okay. we'll have to wait for Helen. So if the brooch is Anglo-Saxon, did it come from a settlement, a grave, or even a palace? While the jury's out, Mick's still determined to test the theory that the palace may be in the village at Eastry Court. So Geofiz set off to survey David's luscious lawns. Meanwhile, another extraordinary find has been made at Highborough Hill. Look at this, come on over. It gives John Gator a reason to feel smug, believing he's won a Geofiz jackpot. This is a first. You haven't finally found some, have you? <laughs> that is the first time we've ever found a windmill. Windmill? Well, I've been told there's a windmill on top of the hill here. But we are on the top you, of the hill. Where is it? If you extend the trench a couple of metres under the digger, what I think you're going to find is the cross pieces, the timber supports for the windmill. Do we know when it was up here? Well, some of them are 12th century, apparently. It's for you to find out, because if that's the first time we've got the windmill in geophysics, you can buy me a pint. <laughs> it comes in cheap. I hope it ain't there, then. <laughs> All right, here, let's find the windmill. 
After a few hours, John Gator wins his pint off Phil because we do find the cross beams of a windmill that once stood on the hill. But it's medieval and doesn't help us in our quest to understand what the Anglo-Saxons were doing here. I can't remember a first day on time team where we've had so many really good finds. And yet the irony is that we've got no Anglo-Saxon structures, no cemetery, certainly no palace. What's going on? Well, it's been really hard for me to accept that it's not a cemetery, but all day we've had no graves, no bones, so I've got to come to terms with it, I suppose. And what else it might be? Well, have you got any ideas, Nick? The, the thing that I've come up with, which, which might work, is that I wonder if this isn't a meeting place, one of these moot sites where people gathered for you know, proclamations and trials and stuff like that. So what are all the fines? Well, they are things that are get dropped at the time, but there's no structures here. How do you feel well, about a moot? Well, it's quite a radical suggestion for the 5th, for the 6th and 7th centuries. First of all, I have to look at the fines to see what the breaks look like. Could they have been rolling around in the plough soil for hundreds of years? If it was a moot hill, what would be its association with the rest of the country round about? Well, you'd expect there to be as there was in later times, a central meeting place to serve a big estate. But because it's not permanently occupied, you'd expect the, the main residence, the hall, the farm buildings, possibly the church, to be somewhere else on that estate. So where might that be here? Well, I think in this case, it's probably down at Eastry. It's probably down by the church and, and Eastry Court. So the answer to what's going here could lie down there? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we should go and work next, I think. Tomorrow? Yeah. You up for a pint? Mine's a shandy. <laughs> <laughs> It's the beginning of day two, and yesterday we were trying to solve the mystery at Hybra Hill up there. How come we were getting all these Anglo-Saxon finds? Could we have a cemetery? Might there be a palace? We certainly weren't coming up with any structures. And by the end of the day, Mick thought that what we might have was a moot hill or meeting place, and all the finds were just things that people dropped when they were meeting each other. But he also thought that the key to the whole mystery might lie not up there, but down down here at Eastry Court, where John's been geophysing. Mick, what do you think the link could be between a moot hill and this place here? Well, you'd expect the moot hill to be the administrative and probably legal centre of a big estate. You'd also expect another centre that was the agricultural centre, probably had the church and that sort of stuff. And I think that's more likely to be down here where the later medieval church is. So somewhere around here is where I would expect the early centre to be. Yeah, but what do you expect us to find under the gardens? That's my problem. I think right here, there's going to be bits more of this medieval building. We know this is a medieval hall inside. There's going to be other structures going with that, in either stone or timber. I would also probably expect burials, because the graveyard probably was bigger, came further out from the church. And then under that, there could be Saxon buildings and stuff as well. So I think there's probably a whole sandwich of stuff somewhere in this area. Have you got anything on your geophys that, by the remotest <laughs> stretch of the imagination, can reflect what he's just said? Well, I've probably got all that, <laughs> um, but I just I don't know where. I mean, it's a fantastic garden, yeah. but it's a nightmare from our point of view. There's drains going through, yeah. there's paths. It's been landscaped, the levels have changed. Yeah. From what you've described, to be honest, I think our best target are these responses here. They might be wall footings, yeah. and that's just here. It's close to the church, yeah. close to the buildings. Let's give that a try. I think anywhere in this area would be useful to us. So you're happy to put in something Absolutely, here? Absolutely, yeah, that's yeah. ideal. Hang on a minute. David, stop lurking, watching us working. This is your house, your lawn. Do you fancy helping us dig the trench? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You'll have to put on some older clothes than that, mate. You look far too smart. <laughs> I'll see you later. OK, we'll see you later. I want to see him sweating. <laughs> Drive him hard. <laughs> Mick puts in the first trench right next to David's house. While hopefully this will give us the archaeological story, Stuart sets off on his own mission to find out what the landscape can tell us. Studying old maps, he's tracking pathways and routes to find evidence of a royal Anglo-Saxon site. He's particularly interested in the location of Eastry Church. 
Although it's medieval, the original church on the site might have been Anglo-Saxon. Around the time we expect a centre of power at Eastry in the 7th century, Christianity was spreading in Kent, and a new church would have been at the heart of an important estate. For Stuart, the present church could lie right in the middle of an Anglo-Saxon royal enclosure, and if there's a royal enclosure here, there would have been a palace here too. David's now sweating away, ruining his own garden, trying to find evidence of this palace. Stuart thinks this is a small price to pay for the promise of a very rare building. It starts to get really exciting because we've got this 1841 tide map right. showing the, the plan of the village. So there's, where are we now? We're in the ground in the garden the, there, Just are there, yeah, there's right. Eastry Court. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Big shape in there, like a big rectangle. Very pronounced rectangle in the middle. It there, is. Isn't it? It's yeah. influenced the layout of the whole village, yeah. and that's been preserved as a shape. If you look at it on the aerial photograph, you see it's all that all the area in there where sat in that that garden there. Down this side is a stream valley. Down yeah. that side is a valley. And what you've got is a big plateau here with this very distinctive area of ground which has never been encroached on. I think this is exactly the sort of place you'd get a Saxon estate centre and then the church sitting inside yeah. it. But it's not just the landscape that suggests there was a palace here. There's also a legend of persecution and treachery. In fact, our earliest reference to a palace in Eastry comes from the 670s from a story of royal betrayal and bloodshed. David, as soon as Sam knew that we were coming here, he went, oh, great, there was a murder here, a murder. What was it? Uh, a royal murder of two princes, Athelbert and Athelrad, two princes of Kent, murdered by their cousin. Undoubtedly, the background story is, is dynastic feuding. And uh, he murders them secretly at night and thinks he's got away with it by burying them in the king's hall. But because of shafts of light that radiate out, the murder is revealed. So what's this white light all about? It's uh, an indication uh, of a miracle. It's a miracle light, God's light, and it means that we've got saints. So it's and like a hammer criminal. horror that the light comes on and yeah, suddenly, yes, oh, yes. oh, it wasn't me, <laughs> Exactly. Uh, interestingly, uh, the bodies were moved to the chapel. And if the medieval chapel is on the remains of an earlier chapel, we're now sitting bang on where the, uh, where the two uh, princes were buried. So there could be a pair of little, innocent, sweet, darling princes buried somewhere under these flagstones. Unfortunately, we, we won't find the murder victims because we know from the saint's life tradition that they were translated to Ramsey in Huntingdonshire. So no bodies? Uh, almost certainly not, but you might find the murder weapon, perhaps. Oh, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> on day one, we found a spectacular brooch on Highborough Hill that seemed to be Anglo-Saxon. Not only that, but the brooch appeared to be high status. Now, after a little cleaning, it's time to hear the verdict. All morning, the diggers up on the site have been saying, is it Saxon, is it Victorian? Helen, you're the specialist. <laughs> what is it? Well, it is actually Victorian. Oh. There's a few things <laughs> <laughs> that give it away. The really big giveaway is the solder on the back. The Victorians um, added separate fixings to their brooches, and the Anglo-Saxons didn't, uh, especially not on a gold piece. Um, secondly, ovals in plain wire, wrong, should be twisted beaded wire um, on something Anglo-Saxon. But the real clincher, the most obvious thing is, on these balls around here, they're dented, so they're hollow. Anglo-Saxons did not make things with hollow gold balls on them. Everything was solid. So I'm afraid it is Victorian. What I don't understand is, there must have been 20 trained archaeologists out there, thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money <laughs> invested in their education, and yet everyone was really tentative about whether or not it was modern or Anglo-Saxon. Why? <laughs> well, I did my PhD on this kind of thing, and I still was a bit nervous about it. It's because until it's cleaned up, you can't see the details, and both the Victorians and the 7th century Anglo-Saxons are both copying Roman designs of jewellery. They were both trying to look as classical as they could and both doing pretty well actually so ultimately they are going to look very similar. Back at Highborough Hill there's still no sign of Anglo-Saxon graves or buildings. It clearly isn't a barrow or burial ground. Mick's idea of a meeting point is the only theory still standing. 
but at least Matt has found some evidence of a structure at the bottom of Trench 1. Matt, what do you think this is now? Well, we've got down to the, uh, the top of this chalk, and it looks, basically, it's, it's a road of some sort. A huge flint nodules have been packed in at the bottom, and then chalk has been tamped down all the way across it. But the most the strangest thing about it, it's like that deep so far. Half a metre. A really two. solid road, yeah. So what kind of road might that be? Well, let me show you what, one that was dug up in Yorkshire that I think really sort of explains what we've got. And there they had a hollow way that had worn out over the years with cattle and people walking along it so on. It got so deep and presumably so boggy that in the end they decided to put a properly built road of, of boulders and stones in the bottom of it. And I think that's probably what we've got here. We've got a hollow way which has then been reinforced with a new road built up. And I think they're probably doing it because this is probably going up to the mill on the top of the hill and it's going to get a lot of use. It couldn't be Saxon. I don't think so. I mean, mills like that don't come into the 12th century anyway. So if it's going up there, it would be later. I mean, at the moment, my guess is that this hollow way might be a bit earlier. It could be, you know, might even be Roman or something like that. But the filling and everything's probably late medieval. So where's the Anglo-Saxon? Well, we've got various finds from across the site. But what we haven't got is any structures at all to go with them. By the middle of day two, Highborough Hill hasn't revealed any more of its Saxon past. In fact, apart from a high-status brooch, the finds on the hill have been almost entirely prehistoric and medieval. Even the iron pot, which we'd hoped was a Saxon cemetery vessel, turns out under X-rays to be nothing but a modern paint pot. Perhaps it was magnolia. With no burials or structures other than a bit of road, Mix left with only one course of action. Mick, why are we closing down the hill? Because I think we've done all we, we need to do and we can do up here and we need to work elsewhere. You know, our ideas that we've got about it won't be helped by more holes. What ideas? Well, you know, we have this idea that it might be a, a meeting point, a, 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 a moot hill where yeah. assemblies were held. Another possibility which has come up is that it might actually have some sort of, um, well, we, we don't have a term for it, a sort of symbolic centre, I suppose. Because if you go along the, the Roman road along there and you look back across to this, it looks like a great barrow. And I'm just wondering whether the name that we've got now of Wodensboro, which is a village over there, didn't actually apply to this. And it wasn't thought that it was where, I don't know, Woden was buried or worshipped or something like that. Mm. And that's why the finds are here. Would the name really have shifted from one place to another? Well, I think it could. It could have happened in the 18th century when there was mm. this amazing find, apparently consisting of 30 glass vessels at Woodensboro. Mm. And people might have said, what could have caused this? Oh, maybe the place name's in the wrong place. Mm. This must be the Woden cult centre and just moved it. Because if this no. is a cult centre, then it's even more likely to have been a meeting point as well. That's mm. documented in lots of yeah. them. Mm. This is typical time team, isn't it? None of us are going to be able to prove this, but we all think it's a really plausible <laughs> theory. <laughs> At least in Eastry Village, Stuart's found some solid evidence of a Saxon enclosure. And this fairly ordinary looking pathway, yeah. I think, is a remnant of the boundary of this Saxon estate centre we've been, oh, right, we've been right. looking for. Because yeah. just when you get to here, yeah. you see how it, it drops off on that side. It I must think, be a couple of metres high here. Yeah, isn't I it? think this, this that we're on top of is a remnant of the bank that defines the western yeah. side of, of this enclosure. Yeah. Yeah. That side's the village. Yeah. That's outside the enclosure, that side's inside. And we're on top, actually, we've walked along a, a big, broad bank. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this that's been preserving this boundary yeah. for, for God yeah. knows how long, yeah. in fact. Yeah, that's yeah. good, that is. But not far away, the first trench at Eastry Court hasn't shown up any sign of a palace or any Anglo-Saxon finds. Promising Geophys results persuade Mick to open a second trench at the bottom of the garden and a third trench near the church, ripping up even more of David's lawn. If that looks all right, uh, when he replaces it, I'm a Dutchman. <laughs> so God, you're going to be very happy. <laughs> yeah, Dennis is going to be deeply miserable at that. Oh, dear. Despite the lack of evidence from the trenches, 
Stuart's still banging on that the garden is in a royal enclosure. Stuart, all day you've been saying, we're in the right place, we're in the right place. We've dug loads of trenches now, and we haven't found the palace. And I'm going to carry on saying we're in the right place. Now, if you look at this photograph we took from the, the helicopter, this is the, the area of the enclosure. There's the, the church there. This bit I've highlighted in white, that actually survives on the ground. It's a footpath now. <laughs> but what makes you think that just because we've got a bit that's extant there, that there were all those other bits there? Because they're continued in the mapping. You can see their boundaries are continued through the different generations of maps, and they still exist mm. to this day. Why so much space? It's a very big enclosure for yeah. a relatively small palace. Yeah. I think that's, to, again, designed for status reasons. You know, you want your buildings to look impressive with lots of open space around them. Rather like, you know, Buckingham Palace isn't hemmed in with lots of other buildings. It's, it's got nice spaces around. It emphasises the dramatic size of the buildings in the middle. But if the Royal Saxon enclosure and palace are in Eastry Village, and Mick's right that there is a Saxon ritual centre on Highborough Hill, could the two be related? Can we borrow those, Frank? Mind your head now. We'll do Thank it. You. Stuart, now on a roll, must have had a shot of divine inspiration. He's got yet another theory. Oh, Stuart, come and have a look. So where's Hybra Hill from here? Can you see that pylon? Well, the, the site's just to the right of that pylon. It's behind the trees there. Let me show you on this portable, interactive, digital workstation. <laughs> 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 we're, we're here on the church at Eastry, and Hybra Hill is, is over there. Now, they look detached, don't they? You, know, you can't really see any yeah. connection between the two, but what's emerging, looking at the landscape, is that there are a network of parallel roads established in this landscape long before the Roman period. I've started to mark them up in, in pink, coming through here. In fact, you can see one of them over there, cross, going through the middle of those yellow fields of rape. The green? The green road, yeah. And there's another one crossing over the hill over there, that green hedge line coming, coming over the top. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about one of these roadways, this one here, it actually goes right by Hybra Hill, i.e. Hybra Hill is on a major routeway, so a mixed idea of a meeting place. Makes sense, because Absolutely. it would have been on the road, yeah. yeah. But we've also got another one which comes out of the corner of this enclosure at Eastry and it heads out the back and actually takes you up towards Hybra Hill. I think Hybra Hill is on a major network of roads but also we've got a connection between this enclosure and Hybra Hill itself. And remember that bit of road that Matt found on the hill earlier in the day? Thanks to Stuart, we now think this very road is part of the one that runs between the hill and the enclosure. And Stuart's got yet another idea. Now, another interesting aspect is that we've got a little corner inside this enclosure here, which is just down there. It's now called the recreation ground. It's a nice open green space. And it's always been within this enclosure. The village has never encroached on it, so the chances of it being disturbed by later development are quite thin. So are you thinking what I'm thinking? Trenches? Yeah, absolutely. The recreation ground Stuart wants to investigate is in one corner of the enclosure. But with jumbled geophys results there, Mick's instead putting all his resources into Eastry Court Gardens, with trenches clustered around the other side of the church. Fueled by his conviction, Stuart tries to persuade Mick that opening trenches in the recreation ground is a priority. But Mick's not having any of it. It's all very busy here, Mick, but we haven't forgotten about the recreation ground, have we? No, but when I had a look at it, I was very worried about all those earthworks over the top of it, whether there were later cottages or whatever. Mm. Whereas this had rather nice geophysics on it. So I thought we'd start here. Right. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very keen to look at that area because there have yeah. been fines up from that area. It's within this enclosure. I'm a bit worried we sort of forget about that side. We need to sample over a, a big area. Well, we've got three things going on in here anyway. It's a bit lopsided. It's on this side well, of the church. But, you know, we've got enough on our hands for the moment. Right. But we will go over there, won't we? I mean, I'm sure we'll get to that eventually. Is that a promise, then? No. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, no. By the end of the day, we've moved all our resources to Eastry Court in our search for the palace. But having not yet found anything, how far has that got us? 
certainly, in a way, I don't feel that we've advanced at all from where we were at the beginning of day one. We knew that that hill had got some amazing finds, and sure enough, it's got more amazing finds. Oh, we have moved on, though, because we've now got a lot of holes open in the village. You know, so we're, we're well on the way to sorting out what's going on under East Street. But the hill itself has been pretty intractable, isasn't it? Yeah, it's been terrible. I feel really inadequate because, as you say, I don't think we are any further on with it. No, and I thought it was going to be so easy. No, but we are because the, the local archaeologists have been saying to me this evening that they now know more about that hill than they did and what the context of those finds are. So they don't feel it's, you know, we haven't moved on. They now know a lot more about the hill. That's good. Mm. Yeah, but we haven't got the link between the hill and the village. Have well, we? I think we have. I think looking at the pattern of roadways, it fits into a pattern which links it with Eastry, which is where the core of the activity yeah. is. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. links the hill to what? Well, the centre of activities in Eastry, we, which we shall get, hopefully, when we've finished digging all those holes in the middle. We haven't finished them yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got a large enclosure there. I think we're confident we're digging in the right place for yeah. the right reasons. Yeah. So we've dug in one bit, bit and we've got a great opportunity to dig in another bit, and that's the recreation ground. And we shall start that tomorrow. You've been putting it off, haven't you? Yes, I have today, but we shall start it tomorrow. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So can we find the heart of Anglo-Saxon Eastry? Will we find it underneath the recreation ground? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll know tomorrow. Yeah, we? cheers, mate. Cheers. <laughs>Day three here in Kent, and we've had some fantastic finds up at Hyborough Hill. We're still putting in trenches down here at East Street Court, but could the centre of our Anglo Saxon royal estate be here in this little recreation ground? Phil, I see they've got you working here at last. Well, somebody got to, otherwise, we'll never find out. At East Street Court, digging continues in our search for the palace, with a new trench opened next to the house. Just when we thought the Hybra Hill story had ended, Mick's now having his ear bent by John Gator, who's determined to excavate some unexplored geophys anomalies. The thing is, Mick, on day one, I'd got this very distinctive area of noise. Yeah. We've got anomalies that extend for 20, 25 yeah. metres across the hillside here. Yeah. At the start, I I didn't know whether it was cemetery or whether it was occupation. Yeah. But we're not quite sure what the occupation is, because yep. it's very well, odd. It is. Well, I, yeah. I think, therefore, to, you know, abandon it, not knowing whether we've got Saxon here, yeah. because we haven't dug some of the features, Yeah. it seems we haven't answered the question. I think we need to get dating material out, because at the moment... All we've got is a couple of sherds of medieval. Yeah, but we haven't just got two bits of medieval pot. We have got medieval pot out of this ditch here. We've got a medieval pot out of the pit down there as well. This is one load of medieval stuff that's come out of all the features up here, except for two bits of sacks, sacks and pot, yeah. that were actually yeah. stratigraphically above the medieval in one of those pits. So they are derived from you, something on the top. I mean, if you're yeah. happy to ignore this then and dismiss that as possibly being Anglo-Saxon, you're saying it's all no, medieval. I mean, you know, why, in the time we've got, why don't we just strip another area and, given your worries about dating evidence, dig whatever feature we're on top of in there so that we get some more dating evidence of one sort mm. or another, but we don't strip that big an area that we can't handle it yeah. in the remaining yeah. time that we've got. Mick reluctantly agrees to go along with John's idea and extends the top of Trench too. While in the recreation ground, Phil's pulling out all the stops in the hunt for the palace. But with the lack of any hard evidence, our palace remains a virtual one. With help from our historians, Raysan finally reveals what such a palace may look like. When people looked at it in the surrounding countryside, how do you think they would have felt about it? Well, it's the great ideal that it, 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 it the equivalent of Camelot in 7th century Kent as a great building that is the, the focus for all that is good and noble. It's a place of identity and solidarity. If you were a football supporter, it would be your great stadium where the great action, the great dramas took place. I can see that its dimensions are really grand, but would it have been the colour of a garden fence? A uh, very interesting possibility uh, is that they would have had some gilt paint. Uh, it parallels a description we have of the Temple of Old Uppsala, 
which could be sh seen shining, and there was something described as a, a golden chain around its roof that shone for miles around. So there could be some kind of decorative frieze. Yeah, the exactly, it, exactly. I think that's what I'd do if I had one of those. Yes. Would you put money on there being one of these in Eastry? From the documentary sources, which, as far as the 7th century go, are very, very good, emphatically yes, Tony. I'm absolutely convinced that it was here and looked like this. The search for such a building continues at the recreation ground. Phil? Yo! You got a palace in your trench? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, we got two scruffyish looking features. There's one in there and there's one in there. They might turn out to be some, but apart from that, absolutely nothing. Stuart, you promised me a royal palace. <laughs> <laughs> I could almost smell the mead and the roast boar. Well, I still think we're in the right place for the right reasons. I mean, that's the critical point here. There doesn't seem to be any debris, modern or post-medieval mm. debris. To me, that implies that the village hasn't been allowed to spread into this enclosure that we've, we've identified, yeah. which implies that somewhere around this space is something very special. Mick, why are these palaces so difficult to find? Because they're built of timber, post holes mm. and stuff like that, and really you need a large area to see whether the plan of post holes and slots makes any sense. And so where they've been found, it's been in gravel pits where you can strip a large area and mm. see what the plan of everything is. It's, you know, it's difficult with little holes in an occupied area to piece anything together. But this is, this is incredibly clean, isn't it? it mm. is, that is the, yeah. the most amazing yeah. thing. Yeah. To be in the middle of a village, to be in the yeah. middle of a village yeah. and find nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. always great on Time Team when they get really enthused about finding sweet Fanny Adams, isn't it? <laughs> well, what are we supposed to do? I think we dig more holes. Mm. Much to Stuart's relief, Mick opens a second trench in the recreation ground. Over at Hybra Hill, John's fight to reopen the dig has paid off. Well, sort of. Was it worth it? Well, I think so. Look, we've got more features that we didn't know about, and we've got Saxon pottery. What's that feature? Well, we've got a ditch, Tony, that's running up this brown material up towards the hill and round in that direction. What about the pottery, John? Where did you find that? Well, it came from the ditch. It did. Came. So can we now say we've got an Anglo-Saxon ditch? <laughs> well, if you want to see the pottery... Yeah. Tell me if this is evidence of a Saxon community. <laughs> is this it? <laughs> it's, it's Saxon. <laughs> 850 AD. This is the sum total of our finds in your trench, John. <laughs> Another triumph for Geofiz. <laughs> at least this is better than what's been found in the trenches at East Tree Court Gardens. Absolutely nothing. Hello, Paul. How are you, Alan? In a newly opened trench at the recreation ground, at least there's a glimmer of hope. Uh -huh. Now, don't get too excited. It's probably not the biggest piece of pottery you've ever seen, but um, it's a piece of decorated early Saxon pottery. That's amazing. <laughs> it is minute. It is. But you can just see those, those kind of grooves. What are they made it's with? It's combing. It's the sort of thing you get, the classic Anglo-Saxon urn with the combed panels with the stamps in and that sort of thing. It's something along those lines, I think. So does this mean uh, accessory vessel in a grave or a cremation, or could this be the kind of thing that's used on a settlement site? Hard to say. I mean, decorated pottery tended to get mainly used in graves, but you do get it on settlement sites as well. It's not very common on settlement sites, but you do find it. Might it indicate a particularly high status site? You can't really say that from, the pot from that, no. It turns yeah. up on sites of all sort of different sorts of status, you yeah. Well, either is pretty exciting. It's <laughs> a start, fun. certainly, isn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. But another minute piece of pottery seems little consolation for having found no evidence of an Anglo-Saxon palace in any of the trenches. So why haven't we found it? Ah, that's a, that's a, a good question. If you look at this photograph that took from, from the helicopter, I put these yellow dots, you can see them. These are the trenches that we've dug in this, yeah. in this area. I've done something similar um, over the top of... This is a Royal Anglo-Saxon palace in, in Northumberland. Yeah. And at the same scale, I've drawn on dots which match the spacing of our trenches. And look. We could have dug like missed that, the palace missed here. it. We could have dug that, missed, missed the it. palace. We could, have, we could have gone on missing it. We could have dug 50 trenches and carried on missing it. Yeah. But we've only dug in one section of the enclosure. Why didn't we excavate there and there and there and there and there and there? Well, that was a bit frustrating, that, because 
all this area in here, we just couldn't get access into it. Farmer wouldn't let us get in, you see. Yeah. So we've missed it by bad luck. Well, that and the fact that we really needed to strip large areas, as, as they've done when they found palaces and other sites, to see the patterns of post holes and timber slots and all the rest of it. It's difficult to do in a village that's still lived in and still occupied. You can't bulldoze it all out of the way. By the end of the day, no more finds or structures have been found in the enclosure. So yet again, Time Team has failed to find an Anglo-Saxon palace. But we have found out something about Anglo-Saxon Eastry. In the 7th century, a community would have thrived here in Eastry. Near a Roman road and the coast, it would have been an important and powerful centre for East Kent. High status finds on Highborough Hill led us to think the palace was there. We now think it was an Anglo-Saxon ritual centre, where valuable offerings were made. Through Stuart's investigations, we've revealed that the hill was on a network of ancient roads, linking it with an Anglo-Saxon centre at Eastry Village. We now believe that it was somewhere in the village that the palace was once built, inside a royal enclosure, with Eastry Court, the church and recreation ground at its heart. But there are still questions our landowners want answers to. Graham was playing on that hill when he was a little boy. What can we tell him about it? Well, Given how emotional these three <laughs> days have been for you and that hill. <laughs> well, it's still, it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, that hill. It is producing the most stunning objects which look like they must have come out of graves. We've carefully excavated the areas around them and there aren't any graves. I do not understand it. So, Helen, what would be your best guess as to what was going on up there? Well, I think actually Mick's idea about it, it being a cult centre mm. Um, devoted to Woden might well be the best hypothesis we've got, which we just need to then go out and test in other places because we really don't know anything about cults that deserve <laughs> they produce this kind of range of wonderful metalwork. And I think really the answer might be that next time you go up on the hill, you just offer up a little prayer to Woden. Good harvest for you, a few answers for us. <laughs> <laughs> what about the village? That's what David's interested in. Well, I think we know a, an awful lot more about it now. and We've got this rectangular enclosure in the middle. Inside that is your house and the church. I'm sure that's the, the centre of the Saxon palace complex. If there's one thing you would like to know from the work that we've done, what would it be? I'd really like to know if this is the site of the original Saxon palace and where the murder was done. I think almost certainly it's either under your house or it's Im just immediately to the east of here. But we won't actually know unless you take your house down and we can have a look underneath it. I'll call you. OK. <laughs> <laughs> the Nick Broomfield Week starts on More 4 tomorrow night with a premiere of his Big White Self in which Nick returns to South Africa to meet Eugene Terreblanche. Catch that from nine. Up next here on 4, Mike and Susan face a crisis in Desperate Housewives. <laughs>